Good morning. I'm Ben Ayers, Dean of the Terry College of Business at the University of Georgia. And let me thank all of you for being with us this morning. Um, it's been a while. It's been about 19 months since we've been able to host this series, and we are so thrilled to be starting up this series, and it's so great to see everyone here. We're here at the Terry Executive Ed Center. This is the home of our professional MBA program, our executive MBA program. I know we've got some of our students here with us this morning. Uh, it's also the home of our executive uh, education programs, and we offer open enrollment programs as well as custom programs here uh, for leading companies in Atlanta and across the state and beyond. So it's, we're thrilled to be back hosting here in Atlanta. Let me take a moment to uh, thank our alumni board for uh, their work on this series. Our co-chairs this year are Brad Turner and Jamie Hawkins. So thank you for both of you for your work today and for this entire series. I also want to thank our sponsors. And so our corporate sponsor is Synovus. They've been with us for many, many years uh, through the renovation of this space through COVID. And so we are so pleased to have them continue to sponsor this series. So please join me in thanking them. We also want to thank our media sponsors, Atlanta Business Chronicle, as well as Atlanta Public Broadcasting, WABE. So please join me in thanking them as well. So a little update from Athens, and obviously you know that we're undefeated, uh, ranked number two. Uh, so that's not new news, but what is news, uh, US News this week released their annual rankings of universities and public and business schools. University of Georgia did very, very well. We once again ranked in the top 20, number 16 among public universities. We're thrilled for that recognition for the university. The Terry College also did very well. We ranked this year number 13 among public business schools, and all of our majors that have a ranking were ranked in the top 20 among public business programs. That's the first time in our history, and so we are thrilled with that type of national recognition and how it reflects on the university, our students, and obviously on the state of Georgia. So we are celebrating great news, not only for our football team, but also for the university and the Terry College. Uh, this fall, we have a wonderful lineup for our Terry Third Thursday. Uh, next month, October 21st, we'll welcome the Jay Reed Parker, Director of Athletics. Josh Brooks will be here. Hopefully he'll be telling us about the undefeated season that we are having and will have throughout the year. In November, we'll have Chris Romack. Chris is the Chairman and CEO of Georgia Power. So truly an all-star lineup to get started back with our Terry Third Thursday series. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, UGA alumnus, Governor Brian Kemp. Governor Kemp graduated from the university in 1987 with a BSA and was elected Georgia's 83rd governor in November of 2018. As an Athens businessman and civic leader, he started his first business, Kemp Development and Construction Company, over 30 years ago. Now, over 30 years later, successful entrepreneur with business and investments in banking, farming, timber, manufacturing, as well as in real estate. Governor Kemp has served on the board of Suncrest Stone and Tifton as a founding director of First Madison Bank and St. Mary's Hospital's board in Athens. He entered public service in 2003 to represent Oconee County and parts of Clark and Walton counties in the Georgia State Senate. He served as director as Secretary of State from 2010 to 2018 when he was elected our 83rd governor. Please join me in welcoming Governor Brian Kemp. Well, thank you, Dean Ayers, for that. I, I appreciate that. You know, I ended up graduating with a degree in agriculture, and I was trying to get into business school, and I just got my grades up and decided to change my major and didn't do that. And if I'd have known how hard chemistry and physics was going to be, I probably would have just gone on into the business school. But I've always uh, been a big fan and really appreciate what all of you are doing and just honored to be here this morning with so many great Terry College representatives and leaders, obviously a lot of distinguished alumni and special guests that are here uh, to really hear more about what the college is doing under the great leadership of the dean and a lot of other hardworking folks. And I just want to really thank you guys for what you're doing to help supply the state's workforce. To me, that's probably the number one issue that we have right now in our state is continuing to find people that we can get into the 
workforce, and I literally hear that every single day from just about every business person I'm talking to, and it doesn't matter what field or what sector it's in. And so we're grateful for what you're doing and certainly appreciate the faculty and staff and, and all the others that are helping to continue to support the college. And I just, you know, really appreciate, especially as a father of three daughters, two, well, one that's graduated from Georgia and two that are going through the process now about the opportunities that, you know, they're going to have being at a great institution and also just being in the state of Georgia when they get out. And uh, I know that is something that we continue to work on and continue to support from our efforts in the governor's office, but not only just us working with the great leaders in the General Assembly that have been great supporters of higher education in our state. And, you know, a lot of people, I really learned this when I was serving in the legislature because I represented, obviously, the university being from Athens. It was in my district. And that's a, you know, that's a good and a bad thing sometimes. It's, a, it's very challenging. There's a lot of needs, a lot of wants, and a lot of asks, but it's also just an incredible asset. And UGA's economic impact right now has risen to $6.5 billion uh, in regards to our, our state. So it's a massive entity that does a lot of good. And when we're pitching the state to companies that are looking to continue to expand here or bring you know, part of their operations here or even their global headquarters here, you know, certainly the University of Georgia and the Terry College uh, in particular is always a big draw for being able to hire and continue to hire great talent. And that's something that has been a benefit, not only to my administration, but to a lot of prior administrations in our state. And we, you know, I think that's contributed to our economic success in our state, along with, you know, a lot of great logistics and other things. But that is what we've got to have when you're in a uh, changing global marketplace. And I know the, the grads and uh, just the, the rankings and the reputation of the college and the people coming out of that is something that we'll continue to sell here in Georgia and also is just a great opportunity for our students. And I believe that we're going to continue to really hold on to the momentum we have right now, which is kind of shocking to be saying something like that in the middle or hopefully at the, you know, last stages of a global pandemic that we've been fighting now, I guess, for 18 months or so. But I think that's because we've really approached this in two different ways. We've been working hard as anybody in the country to protect lives against COVID-19, really bringing a, you know, common sense look to that. And if you look around the country, you've really seen how important, you know, who your governor is matters uh, on the way that people have made different choices. And I've been very careful not to criticize other governors, uh, and I've had some that have criticized me. But, you know, everybody's dealing with their own state. I feel like they know their state better than I do, and, you know, they're elected leader. And, and to be honest with you, I got all I can handle here in Georgia. I'm not worried about <laughs> governing somebody else's state. But I think our approach, if you start looking and measuring, you know, COVID metrics, we've done as well as anybody in the country can do when you're dealing with the global pandemic and something like COVID-19 that literally changes daily. Uh, I was reading a story this morning in the Wall Street Journal about the, bo the vaccine booster, and like it was just all over the place. <laughs> You know, you had people on both sides of that issue saying, you know, who should get it? Should anybody get it at all? And I got through reading that, and I was like, well, that's great. We have no direction whatsoever <laughs> on the COVID booster. But maybe we'll have some coming. Uh, but that's what we've been dealing with literally every day for, you know, 18 months now. But we've also been worried about protecting livelihoods and people's paychecks. And that's been just as important. And I knew that was, you know, 15, 16 months ago, really when a lot of people weren't thinking about that. You know, they were thinking about the short-term narrative of what do we got to deal with today, which we were doing. I mean, we had a whole team. We were working 24-7, still have been. But as somebody that's been a small business owner for 35 years, you know, I was also thinking about, like, wh where are we going to be in six months? Where are we going to be in a year from now? Because most small business owners that are like myself or people that are working for those businesses, you know, they, they can't survive two to three weeks or two to three months with not being open. I mean, it's just impossible. I mean, there's not enough government assistance 
to make that happen. And we've seen around other parts of the country where they haven't. I mean, you have generational businesses that are gone forever, um, which is really a tragic thing. And I, I just felt like, from my experience uh, of being a small business person and, and going through that before, but then just feeling like I had a you know fairly good pulse on the state, even though all these decisions you make are, you know, everybody can question every single one, and they do, and that's fine. It's part of the job, but it's even worse in a pandemic. Um, and I know this won't shock y'all, but there has definitely been pandemic politics at times in our state. But, you know, I just had the really the, the feeling in my gut and in my heart that, like, people are not going to stay home in their basement and lose everything they've worked decades for. I know I wouldn't. I know my partners wouldn't. And I didn't feel like other hardworking Georgians would do that either. And that's why, you know, I really took a, a, a you know, early approach to reopening the economy against a lot of criticism from a lot of people uh, all around the country. You know, I was the face of that for really three days straight in the national media. And, but I still felt like we were doing the right thing. And there were a lot of people that made fun of me saying, hey, why are you opening salons and tattoo parlors and bowling alleys and, you know, things of that nature? You know, they're not essential. And I said, well, if you own it, if you get your paycheck from that business, if you own the building that's paying you rent uh, for being there, and that's how you feed your family, pay your rent, make your car payment, or get your paycheck, it's pretty essential. And that's the view that I had. It didn't matter what kind of business it was. If you're the one that owns that, you know, to you, it's the most essential business that's out there. And I think we made the right decision um, by plowing through that, not backing down. And we really led the rest of the country, I believe, in the great American comeback. And it's been incredible what, uh, what we've seen going on. And, you know, I just did that because I've been there before. I mean, I've been there where Marty and I are home on Friday night, and it wasn't just one Friday night. It was Friday night after Friday night, month after month after month after month during the Great Recession, wondering, you know, are we ever going to survive this? We barely paid the people working for us, couldn't pay a, lot, pay a lot of our suppliers, couldn't sell anything. And you get in that position, you have two choices. You can give up, throw the keys back to the bank, or you get up on Saturday morning, and a lot of times on Sunday morning, go back to work and just try to grind through it and, and make it long enough till something changes. And I've done that, we have, more than once. And uh, I've had many days where people working on construction sites of mine, they have more money in their pocket than I had in my bank account, and I own the dang company. Um, and that's why I did what I did. But I believe we, what we did was right. And we're seeing the benefits of that approach now. For 15 straight months, our unemployment rate has dropped in Georgia. I hate to look back to the pandemic because I think about what we were dealing with 15 months ago. It was terrible, you know, and everybody was. A uh, lot of uncertainty. Nobody knew how to deal with COVID. People scared to death. I mean, literally, we're flying PPE supplies to hospitals and trying to set up bed capacity and, you know, trying to get testing supplies and everything else and dealing with a lot of other things in our state. But, you know, for 15 straight months, our unemployment rate has dropped in Georgia. It stands at 3.7% right now, which to me, I think is the new full employment because, I mean, everybody I talk to is looking for work. If there's anybody out there that wants to work, they can find a really good job, better than uh, what was offered before the pandemic. But because of that, we have the lowest unemployment rate of the 10 most populous states. And when you think about that, you always hear a lot about Florida's economy and Texas and, you know, a lot of other states. We've got the lowest unemployment rate of the 10 most populous states. And I think that says a lot for our state, but it also says a lot, you know, for what you all are doing and us supplying the workforces out there that's making people want to come to Georgia. Because as hard as it is for people to hire right now, we're still doing a lot better than most states are of getting back to full employment and keeping our economy open. And it's been incredible that we've been able to do that because our revenue growth has been off the charts even in a global pandemic, which we never would have thought. We were able to cut taxes last year by $140 million in the middle of a pandemic. 
We've incentivized a lot of job creators to come to our state and expand business here. We've been able to balance our budget. We've avoided draconian cuts to essential uh, services. And last year in the amended budget and the big budget, we were able to fund back big chunks of you know, budget cuts that were implemented during the early part of the pandemic, not knowing what was coming. So we funded back you know, over a half a billion dollars to public education, including the university system and a lot of other things, obviously public safety and health care. But we've also seen record job growth and investment in the state, which is also, I just kind of shake my head when I say that, because we're in the middle of a global pandemic. And there's $11 billion of new investment coming to our state from existing companies that are growing, new businesses that we've attracted here. That is a 46% increase over a banner year last year, which is like, you know, 46% increase. Our, the jobs that have been announced with those projects is a 5% increase over last year, almost 34,000, or I guess it's, I think it's up to 34 now. 32 to 34,000 new jobs. Just about every single one of those jobs, the starting pay will be more than the average starting pay uh, in that county. So it's raising the opportunities for hardworking Georgians out there. We did that with uh, 379 projects that we worked on last year. 74% of those were outside the metro Atlanta area. So we've got a lot of great things happening in Atlanta. Existing companies are continuing to hire. But the new, the new deals that we're doing are literally spread all over the state. And that is going to be great for our economy because it's strengthening a lot of areas that, you know, have been shrinking in population. There wasn't good opportunities in parts of rural Georgia and other places around the state. And I'm just, I'm really excited about the opportunities that we have now for people literally to have great paying jobs and opportunity and experience entrepreneurship and, and great business in all parts of our state and even in, in rural Georgia. And since I became governor, we've announced, and this is kind of incredible too, thinking, you know, really for a year and a half out of the two and a half years I've been governor, we've been dealing with the pandemic, but we've worked 900 project locations, over 20, $21 billion of investment and 70,000 jobs have been created. So I think that says a lot for our state. And because of that, we are on the map nationally and internationally. I mean, like everybody that's looking to do a project in the United States, whether it's a global company looking to bring a North American operation or for somebody that's in Georgia that's trying to find more talent, like a lot of the tech companies, whether it's Microsoft, Amazon, whoever it is, they're all looking to Georgia, specifically Atlanta, because they just can't find the talent in, in California and other places, and the cost of living is so expensive, and the quality of life here is so good uh, compared to a lot of those others. And so we're, we're you know, really working hard and I think doing a lot of great things. And that's why I'm so excited about, you know, our kids that are going to be graduating from the Terry College and those that are getting MBAs and other things, this is going to be a great opportunity here in our state. And my message to be to you would be, look, you can go anywhere in the world and work. I'm very sure of that because you have the, you know, you're going to have the degree and the pedigree, if you will, to be able to do that. But I would urge you to stay here in Georgia. There is so much opportunity here. We need you here. You should be loyal to your state and your university. Stay in Georgia. <laughs> but if you don't, we'll brag about you wherever you're going. But we're going to continue, I think, to be in a great shape and I think what the Dean said about just the rankings of the University of Georgia and the Terry College with the uh, US World Report uh, really says a lot about what all of you uh, are doing and all of you that are working hard every day that never get your name mentioned like I might or the Dean might but we just appreciate what you're doing and uh, you know lastly we have got to continue to hunker down and go dogs. <laughs> I think I'm going to throw it to the dean. We've got some time now for uh, question and answer. So I'm going to ask Blake Rollison to join the governor. The chair's there. Blake is our director of state government relations for the University of Georgia. And so we've got microphones. So if you have a question, if you'll raise your hand, and one of our staff members will deliver that, and then uh, Blake will help direct. 
Uh, you mentioned rankings at the end of uh, your talk there, and, and obviously Terry and Georgia is enjoying some great rankings. The state also has been consistently one of the top states to do business in the country, if not the best by rankings. We've enjoyed some great uh, success in um, economic development side. SK was a big win. Microsoft's a big win. The port continues to grow. You mentioned workforce. Uh, Terry's doing what they can to, to help with that. What, what specific investments can the state make to help grow that workforce and attract talent and, and build talent? Well, that's a great question, and I uh, just want to tell everybody how excited we are to have Blake at the University of Georgia. He was doing some policy stuff for us in the governor's office, and um, we hired Grant Thomas back to do health care policy, so we've got a great UGA grad dealing with that, which we have a lot going on, and uh, we know Blake's going to do a great job over there. But, you know, I get that question a lot, and thankfully, uh, not just me, but, you know, Governor Deal did this, Governor Purdue did this, Governor Barnes did this, and, and you know, a lot of other people, uh, Governor Harris and Miller and others. But we've invested in workforce in our state for a long time. I think what we're seeing now is that's been changing a lot, and I, I kind of have uh, a twofold approach. Number one, we got to continue having, you know, kids coming out of the Terry College and other schools that are research institutions and other great colleges and universities in the fields where we need workforce. And you know, when I think about the university, a few things that come to mind, obviously, you know, the, the Terry College, but you think about just the demand for engineers right, uh, you know, right now and, and how the new, new college, which is not that new anymore. Um, but when our daughter graduated this spring, she's obviously an education major, she's teaching first grade, but they, you know, they broke the graduation up into three or four nights, and we were there when she graduated, and the engineering school was there. And I knew they were doing good, but like when the engineering school graduates stood up, I had no idea there was that many. And like every single one of them is needed. So we have to continue to do more of that. You know, scientists, I mean, there's, de there's a demand. In ag, I mean, there's a demand everywhere. But we really got to be staying focused on what our companies need. And that's where I think, you know, we've got to continue to have the dean, the board of regents, the, the alumni group staying in touch with the decision makers to make sure that we're, you know, offering and, and fluid with degree programs that the private sector needs. The other thing we've got to do is we're just, we're getting killed in service sector industries. And we've got to continue to give students a path that are not traditional, you know, go to the University of Georgia for four years or go to Georgia College for four years or Georgia Southern or wherever and offer them, you know, a job training platform in a technical college or through uh, CTAE programs in high school to learn how to be a mechanic or a welder or, you know, whatever. I mean, those jobs are so in demand right now. They are great starting pay. You know, kids can come out of there with, you know, very little or no debt. And we just got to make sure people understand what the paths are and get people put in the path that's going to be good for, for their individual situation. And I think for a long time we, we didn't necessarily do that. And um, that, that's a real challenge for us right now because, like, everybody I talk to, like, you can be the best MBA grad and you can be the CEO of a company and you can be getting paid a lot of money, but if you can't find a truck driver, to get that container off of that ship, you can't sell it. <laughs> and so that's what we're dealing with right now. But it also is, I think, going to be up to the university system to, you know, and us to be pushing companies and supporting companies and supporting universities that are going to be figuring out, like, how do we get to the day where we can have a truly autonomous, you know, tractor trailer to you know, just deal with some of the loss of all this stuff. I mean, none of these things are easy, but, you know, that's, that's what we're dealing with right now. I mean, you got every major manufacturer in the state from Kia to, you know, whatever, they cannot find enough help. And it's hurting the supply chain. It's, it's creating inflation, quite honestly. And, uh, you know, I could argue about a lot of federal policies that I think have, have not been driving people to get back to the workforce. Um, but we're doing all we can at the state level to do that. Uh, thank you again for joining us this morning. This has been a real treat. 
Um, my question was uh, in regards to uh, the Georgia economy and um, current economic policies, are you seeing right now that with the higher cost of attracting employees, um, that the cost of goods and services is going to create the inflation that's going to stick, or is it, as they say, that buzzword transitory inflation because once, you know, a lot of the endemic comes along and the policies calm down, that, um, that uh, the, the, everything's going to rebalance itself? And uh, Yeah, that's thanks. a great question. And I'm no economist, but I did sleep at the uh, governor's mansion last night. So, you know, I, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I mean, look, this is my, um, and I run the risk of getting myself in trouble here with some of our great economists at our <laughs> higher education institutions. But I keep reading about this whole, you know, transitory inflation or whatever. But just kind of the common sense small business owner person to me and somebody that's dealing with this in state government, I mean, look, we're dealing with, Private sector, you know, you like you have a lot of manufacturers, especially in places like rural Georgia, they've been used to paying ten to twelve dollars an hour. Well, now, you know, their employees, they're leaving, they're going to work at Amazon, they're making seventeen to nineteen dollars an hour with full benefits. So, I mean, that's a substantial ju jump in pay, which is good for their workers. Even though the problem is the inflation I read the other day, they're still. They're still a, a net loser because the increase in pay because of the rise in inflation, they're they're losing a half a percentage point of their of their take home pay or, or what they end up with on their expenses. But you have literally every company across the board is raising their wages. We're we're having to look at that in from state government's perspective of how we compete, which is always really hard. So I'm like, you know, you go there, it's it's really hard to peel that back. You know, like if you're a if you're a company and you raise wages to from fifteen to twenty dollars an hour on the manufacturing line, how are you gonna a year from now go, well, we gotta pull that payback? I mean, I doubt you could do that. You probably have to lay off workers, you know, if things slow down or figure out how to get more productive. So I think there's gonna be part of that. I mean, you, it may not stay as high as it is now, which I think really is, is hurting is gonna hurt our economy, especially when the federal stimulus you know, gives out if it ever does. It may not, you know. Uh, I saw where AOC is wanting to implement the, you know, federal subsidy on unemployment, the additional $300. And I, I like, I, I see no need to do that in Georgia. I mean, we have so many opportunities in every field in all parts of our state. It just does not even make good common sense. And I think even the president realized that when he let it, let it expire. So I'm hopeful that doesn't go anywhere. But I mean, look, I think the inflation the way that we're doing now with in spending, the debt, and just, you know, the what I think will be permanent wage increases, which is not necessarily a bad thing. I think a lot of people are okay paying a little more because they feel like, you know, the, the lower level of the workforce. And we certainly feel this way in state government, and I did even before the pandemic, because when we did the teacher pay raise, the way we did it was we gave, I had promised teachers I'd raise pay $5,000. We did 3,000 my first year. We were going to do two the second year in the pandemic hit. But we gave a flat 3,000. We didn't do it on a percentage basis. So the incoming new teachers that were at the lower scale, you know, their pay was increased 8 or 9%. Folks that have been there for 20 years, their pay increased, you know, whatever it was, 2 or 3. They still got a, the same raise, but percentage-wise, it helped the newer teachers better. And so I think people have a feeling that we need to do that in this economy because you've kind of seen that divide of the, you know, the, the middle class, you know, getting more middle class and the lower class at times going the other way. I don't necessarily think that's happening in Georgia um, just because we stayed open and we have so much great opportunity for people that wanted to work. They've just seen, like, if you want to work, you can get in an entry-level job that pays a lot better now than it ever has, but you're going to have uh, opportunity for upward mobility immediately. And so, you know, but I, I don't, I don't think I, I don't. I personally don't feel like the inflation is going to like just drop back down to where it was. I think it may bump down some, but there's just going to be this level that it's going to stay. I think for a while. You know, our issue, and I think the private sector's issue to me is going to be how do you figure out how to deal with that. 
The other thing is not having enough people in the workforce is hurting our supply chain. And you can't move goods, you know, the, I mean, the, the cost of a shipping container has gone from, you know, people paying $3,000 a container to paying 12 or 15. <coughs> well, when you think about things that are going to, you know, Walmart, Costco, and, you know, low dollar things, and you start adding that percentage of shipping on there, I mean, it's just driving inflation unreal. And I don't see that changing anytime soon because the whole shipping industry's monopolized. There's only three or four of them. There's not enough containers. There's not enough truck drivers. I mean, I just don't see this demand going away anytime in the near future. We have any other questions? Let's get the Move. second greatest Secretary of State ever in the history of Georgia. <laughs> thank you. Governor, thank you for being here this morning. Um, I saw the announcement you made yesterday on a new position to help small businesses across the state. Yeah, I think this group would love to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, Lewis always kids me because he's introduced me many times as a former Secretary of State. And me being a Secretary of State, he introduces me as the second greatest Secretary of State ever. <laughs> So that's why I said that. Um, I'll say it's a lot easier being Secretary of State when you were there than when I was there or when it is or, or now. But uh, we did uh, make the announcement yesterday that Alan Fox is going to be kind of our small business guy over at the Department of Economic Development. And Alan is a, is a great guy. He's done a lot of work in the film and production industry, but he's really hard working, um, you know, understands innovation, entrepreneurship. And I ran on making Georgia the number one state in the country to be a small business person or to work in a small business. Kind of like we've been the number one state for business eight years in a row from a, you know, area development, site development perspective. And that's the people that are, that are really the consultants for the companies that are looking to move to Georgia. They constantly rank us in the top five just from business friendly, good sites, great workforce, you know, uh, easy to permit, you know, all the things that you want if you're trying to move to the market quick. Um, and we're, you know, we're in the top five or six now for small business, but we want to be number one, you know, because I think that's where a lot of opportunity is in our state, certainly is in rural Georgia. And if you look, I mean, 96, 97 percent of our corporations in Georgia are small. They have less than 50 employees. And so that's really what Alan's going to be focused on every day. We also, something I campaigned on, we created a, a uh, rural strike team in the Department of Economic Development. So Brian Marlowe, who's former chamber economic development guy in Tifton, uh, he's put a whole team together. They're working every day on job opportunities, investment, innovation in rural Georgia, trying to you know create jobs, create investments. And this is like an approach that we have, not just to give people opportunities for jobs in rural Georgia, but you cannot support, you know, rural health care facilities, whether it's a hospital, clinic, you know, uh, emergency care, you know, ER, not an ER, but, you know, the, the emergency clinic, I guess, a better, better word for it. If you don't have a population base and a paying population base and a tax base that can help support that at the local level. And you got to have people. I mean, it's a supply and demand issue. So it's very important that we do that. So we got Alan working on the small business side, literally anywhere and everywhere. And then Brian's working on, you know, specifically deal making in rural Georgia. Because there's just a lot of the, a lot of the folks in these rural counties, they don't have the expertise um, to put deals together, to be able to work with companies and know how to, you know, what incentives to offer, how to compete, you know, when to do that. And, and that's what we're helping folks do, kind of having that partnership. And uh, it's, been, it's been going great. <clears throat> Governor, thanks again for being yeah. here. There's a lot of talk about infrastructure these days in Washington and everywhere else. And I'd, I'd love to know your thoughts on how Georgia might fit into that and what, what you'd like to see in Georgia from an infrastructure improvement perspective. Well, I guess the, the good news on that is I think that's something that everybody can agree on from a big picture perspective. I mean, there, there's definitely needs in infrastructure. I think Georgia, really because of the leadership of the General Assembly and Governor Deal passing House Bill 170, it's allowed us to invest a lot more, over a billion dollars a year 
into logistics and infrastructure and you know we've continued just using you know making good use of that money and you can see it around here I mean literally I know it's aggravating but everywhere you drive there's construction projects going on but that's going to be good for our state long term uh, we've also you know e even during the pandemic we've put you know tens of millions of dollars every year into, into redoing older bridges in rural Georgia to help with our you know moving our logistics and and things that's huge for we have the largest forestry industry in the country here that's huge for them it's huge for people moving building supplies and other things you, you know shipping containers on state routes to get them off the interstates and other things and we've been doing a really good job so we're I think we're a lot further ahead than most states but we got really far behind during the recession uh, and so we're still catching up and we always will be but we're doing more than most I think the good thing about the other good thing about the infrastructure bill is you know so I think everybody agrees on it, it it's needed you know we could we could definitely use the money it's not like we necessarily need it but it would speed up a lot of what we're doing the bad news is to me is we can't find enough people now to do all the work that we have so even if we have more money where's the workforce going to come from to do more road projects or mo more bridge projects or you know mass transit whatever wherever it ends up going so that's going to be one of our challenges the other thing is and I haven't heard if this is true or not this is where you know you kind of have this idea that everybody supports but the devil's in the details of you know the you know the budget writers or the rule makers after the the bill passes and I heard that they were going to set the minimum wage for all these federal transportation dollars at $45 an hour I mean that's $93,000 a year and that would be for the lowest level person that's out there holding the you know the stop and slow sign I mean that's like that's going to create chaos and uh, you know hopefully that's not true but I did hear that over the weekend so we'll see you know what they end up what they end up doing but I'll, I'll tell you one good thing we did on transportation because of the CARES Act because this was the last bucket of money that passed uh, at the end of the Trump administration they had some transportation dollars in there and we were able to take that money that we had flexibility with and we used it to backfill um, we pulled state money out of projects that we were working on and we front loaded existing projects and we were able to move three or four projects up that we're doing uh, one of them's on US 1 when you kind of go through uh, Swainsboro going from 16 up through Louisville which is a route to get trucks off of the interstate and move them up you know on the eastern side of our state up into North Carolina and you know have them not coming through Atlanta and other places so we were able to move that project up like two or three years and then we backfilled the money on the on the end on the other, on the federal money on the on the back side where we took the state money because with the federal money you have a longer environmental processing you know permit processing and other things so I mean that kind of I hope they'll give us that flexibility whatever they do infrastructure wise because we can get very creative and move projects up but it's the you know the labor piece is going to be really interesting to see how the contractors can deal with that Go which kind of goes back to my point earlier of you know we got to have these kids that don't want to go to a four-year institution I mean they can go learn how to drive a track track hoe or bulldozer and probably make you know 40 or 50 dollars an hour and they won't have near the headaches that we have to deal with every day <laughs> Do we have any other questions? So you talked about the rural areas and you talked about roads and things of that nature. What about the technology divide that that these communities have, especially as they're trying to attract yeah. business into their community? I wonder what the state's doing around that. Yeah, we've been doing a lot. That's a great question and something again I ran on was, you know, making sure that we had rural broadband and be focused on that. And it really doesn't get written about a lot. I think there's a lot of opportunity with the ARP money that's coming for rural broadband. We've already got committees set up that are taking applications for projects that are coming in from local communities partnering with all kinds of different uh, private sector companies and partnerships. 
food safety and food contact, um, other providers that are out there. The school, the schools, local communities, cities and counties, and us are all getting money. And so we're we're setting these committees up, and we've got liaisons, and we're trying to work with the schools and the counties and the cities to say, hey, let's all get lined up on the project you want in your local community instead of having all three of us doing, or three or four of us doing different things. Let's all get behind a bigger plan. We can leverage all our money, and then it'll be more efficient uh, to work together. So we're doing that. But even before the pandemic, we worked, my first year we passed uh, SB2, which uh, Representative Jay Powell, who passed away, was really a leader, and Steve Gooch was as well up in Dahlonega, who's in the Senate. And they, but the Senate in the House, they had a real divide about how we do this. And so it, when I got in office, we got everybody in the room, we said, look, we got to figure this out. So we were working with all the private sector partners and everything, and it was some tough negotiations. But anyway, we got a bill passed. The Public Service Commission has weighed in on that issue too with the poll, poll tax issue of allowing these providers to run you know, fiber optic cable on the EMC's power poles and how that works and you know, them getting fair payment for that. So we got all that done. And even before this federal money's coming, uh, we started putting, uh, in the amended budget last year, I put $20 million for rural broadband grants and we did 10 million in the big budget. We're gonna continue to do 10 million a year. And that's really helped a lot of these partnerships along with the federal money. So in less than really two years, or in the last two years, I guess is a better way to say that, we got over 300,000 Georgians in rural Georgia that projects have already been announced. It's, I think, right at or just a little over 50 counties. I mean, we're talking about places like Washington County, um, Gray, Georgia. If anybody's ever cut through Gray going from Macon to Eatonton, you know, that whole rural area out there. I mean, you, you drive out there, there's not even cell service in a lot of those spots. In less than two years, they're going to have high-speed fiber as, as fast as anywhere in the country because the partnerships that the EMC is doing with a private provider that's gonna run the cable and do all that, and then they're leveraging you know, state money, federal money, and it just makes it economically feasible for the EMCs to do that. We've done the same thing down on the coast, kind of uh, up the coast from Darien and McIntosh County towards Savannah, you know, some of that kind of long, long county, Liberty County area in, in inland. We've done the uh, the, the same thing uh, really in a lot of the CSRA around Augusta except for McDuffie County and they're working on a proposal right now. And like that is gonna be huge for them. It's gonna be huge for their kids to be able to do their homework at night and get on the internet. It's gonna be huge for you know telemedicine and rural health care. It's gonna be huge because people that you know get fed up of living in California and paying so much they could move to rural Georgia and buy a little farm and have great quality life or they could move somewhere like Darien, Georgia or whatever on the coast and work for you know Microsoft and I think that's going to be great for our state and we're just going to be able to keep doing more of that with the with the ARP funds. Governor so you mentioned Microsoft down in Darien we've got SK Innovations up in Commerce in LaGrange so what, what makes these, some of these rural areas, you know, um, nice for these companies to come to? What, what incentivizes them to get to these rural areas like that? Yeah, well, I think it's just, it's really the workforce. And we kind of do a good job in the department when we're working these, with these companies of trying to not put, you know, two of these same companies in one area. So when, I mean, we were working a really big automobile manufacturer a while back. And like, we didn't want to put them in West Georgia because Key is already, you know, having a hard time recruiting people. So, you know, we were looking in other places around Georgia to, to put them that would be a good fit. Same thing with like Key. I mean, we've been talking to other battery manufacturers and, you know, we're not going to, if we happen to get one, we're not going to put it right on top of Kia. We're going to sp spread those out. So we, we work really hard to do that, but most of it's driven by uh, the workforce, but then also just what the, you know, kind of what the locals are doing. And the way, just so you guys know, the way, the best way for projects to come to fruition is when the locals, you know, 
everybody knows where these sites are. And now these companies, they don't even talk to us anymore. They used to come to us and say, what kind of sites you got? Well, now you know where the sites are. They can get that off the internet. They can keep it tighter to the vest. They can look for sites all over the country. And then when they narrow it down to 10 or 15, they'll go to that county and go, hey, we're looking, we want to look at this site. What can the, and so they, they get their economic developer there. They start working with the company. They put the local package together. Then they're calling us from the local level and saying, hey, what can you guys do? And we start working with them. And then we get great private sector partners. I know Chris Womack's going to be speaking to you guys. But like we work with Georgia Powers. We did a pitch the other day at Georgia Powers' office, and I went by there uh, just to let them know how much I supported this. But they're, they're in the room helping us pitch economic development deals. We do this with the EMCs and other utility partners as well to help sell the state, but it's best when it, you have the local support. Because like if it's the state trying to do something and then the locals don't support it, it makes it very hard to do that. Because then you get citizen opposition at the local level, so it's best if it comes from the bottom up. And, and that's where we're seeing our best deals is with people that have good local governments, good economic development authorities that are pro-business, but then they also have good community support because they know what they know what kind of jobs the community wants. I mean, it, and it's different, you know. In rural Georgia, they may want traditional manufacturing because they're going to have, you know, a lot of money in their capital expenses, which creates a lot of property taxes down the road, and they're going to give them, you know, their their people a, a good wage to, to make. But in other places, it may be that they want to focus on technology and jobs that pay over $100,000 a year. And that's why you really need it coming from the, from the bottom up. But that's, you know, that's why Kia was such a great, pit back in the day because they'd lost so much of the textile industry and you had all these people over there that were dying for a, a good place to work and it was a godsend for them and still is. Any other questions? Oh, here we are. Okay. We could talk sports if y'all want to. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you get more. Oh. Well, yeah. Well, what are you uh, most looking forward to this next year? What am I most looking right. forward to? Coming out of the pandemic and. Yeah, I would say us beating Alabama in the SEC championship. <laughs> I mean, look, as somebody that was in school in the early and mid 80s, like it didn't get better than Saturday night two, two weeks ago when we beat Clemson. I mean, I've been in that miserable stadium up there, <laughs> hot getting our you-know-what kicks, I was glad to see us win that game. You know, I was thinking about this the other day. I was looking at the rankings. I haven't had much time to focus on sports or watching much TV or anything else because I'm usually just reading a lot, trying to stay up with what's going on with the economy and the pandemic. But I was looking at the rankings, and, you know, Cincinnati that we beat in the Peach Bowl in that incredible game, and I went to that game. That was a really good football team. And they were a lot better than I thought they were. And I thought we played good, and that was a big win. I think that gave us a lot of confidence to beat them late like that and kind of get a high-pressure win. But you, look, you looked at them after we beat Clemson. I mean, they're in the top ten again. They may even be like six or seven. And so we beat, you know, we beat a lot of those same players last year with a really good team they had. And then we beat Clemson. And so we – you know, if we can stay humble and hardworking and keep people healthy, we're gonna have a we're gonna have a good year. I think you know, from a just being governor, you know, what I'm looking forward to is us getting more people vaccinated, getting past COVID, and get back to a. I mean, we're in a pretty normal world right now, but it's just not good for us to have these spikes where we have our hospitals filling up. And we've been doing just incredible work with the National Guard and uh, talking to our hospital CEOs every day. And I've been reading stories about other states having to go to this crisis care model where they're deciding which patient they're going to give care to because, you know, we're going to treat the one that has a chance of making it. And if you're not, we're going to give you some pain medicine and sit you in the lobby. I mean, that's a bad situation to be in. Thankfully, we haven't been there because we've all worked together. But, like, I don't want to be worried about that anymore. Uh, I'm ready to, I'm ready to get that. So that's what I'm looking forward to us is getting past that, because every time that happens, like we have weathered this latest spike, just fine. Like there's been no real panic out there. We've just been methodical, working with the hospitals, you know, working with the National Guard and 
suppliers. I mean, a, a lot of other things, continuing to try to educate people on the vaccine. But the media just has a field day with that. And they just really use it because they want to write about the worst things. Like right now, they're still writing about how I haven't done this and done that. And then they're writing about, you know, there's an article in Atlanta paper today about how drastic our ICUs are right now. Like our hospitalization has been falling for almost a week now. And everybody that we're talking to, even if they're still busy, they can, they're, they're telling me their trends are looking good. They know they just have a few more days of this. So like, that's what I'd like for them to be writing about. But they don't want to write about that. They write about the bad stuff. That suppresses people from, you know, going about their daily lives. And it hurts the economy. And that's just, our cases have been plummeting. Like, if you look at the graph on the Department of, or the curve on the Department of Public Health's website, I mean, it's been going down for over a week now. I mean, it is crashing. And that, that's a good sign. It's going to keep going down. And we may have it come back up, but every time we go through one of these, there's just less and less people to get infected. And we got to continue to, you know, follow the data and the science on the vaccines and boosters and all that kind of things as the virus continues to mutate. But hopefully, eventually, this thing turns into more of a yearly flu versus something that, that literally is killing a lot of people that aren't vaccinated. Any other questions? Hardman asked me about sports betting and whether it would pass. I know everybody in here is already doing it. So, um, I mean, look, the legislature's been working on this what last two years, I guess, Lewis, and you know nobody can get to an agreement. People are all over the place. You got some down there that lobbying that want to have you know full casinos. You got others that want to have horse racing. You have others that want to have mobile sports betting, and then you got the whole co-am industry that wants to continue to grow and they don't all line up even they're in even though they're all in the gaming industry and i think that's why the the sports betting thing has been slow to fruition but i'm sure it will be back on the table but i just have i have no idea whether that will get legs or not it, it hasn't the last two years um so we'll see all right Thanks, well, thank, you guys. Yeah, thank you guys all right, thank you. Good job. Thank you, Governor Kent, for being with us today. We uh, have a present for you that is appropriately color colored red and black to commemorate you being with us today. So thank you for taking time. <laughs> we hope that all of you will join us next month. Josh Brooks, our J.B. Parker Director of Athletics, will be here. If we have not validated your parking yet, we would love to do so. So we can do that on the way out. But hope everyone has a good rest of the day. And of course, go dogs.